I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Welcome to the Revelation 13 Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Revelation 13 Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Hopwood. There was once a race of giants that existed in the days before Noah's flood. Giants reappeared again after the flood and reside in Israel and eventually be driven from that land. And their physical presence on the earth would fade away. Many cultures would tell stories of their existence and their deeds. According to the Apocryphal Book of Enoch, they are still here tormenting mankind. The story starts in Genesis chapter 6, And it came to pass, when man began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. In Christian circles there has been a disagreement over what the term sons of God means. Those who don't take the Bible as literal, and those who find the term conflicts with their doctrine, ascribe the sons of God as being either the righteous line of Seth, or as tyrannical rulers. The first theory revolves around the idea that somehow the descendants of Seth were not to marry into the descendants of Cain. Nowhere in the scripture is this prohibition mentioned, or even implied. They even have to change the term daughters of men to daughters of Cain to get their theory to make sense. It also doesn't explain how there were more Nephilim or giants after the flood, since the flood would have wiped out the descendants of Cain. The second theory claims that the term sons of God refers to kings and rulers of men, they take this meaning not from the Bible, but from ancient history. Non-Israelite kings would claim the title as the son of the deity that they worshipped. This theory arose to better explain away the real biblical meaning of the term sons of God. This theory has less scriptural conflicts than the first one, but it's still based on a false premise. The term sons of God is clearly defined in the Bible, as well as in its interpretation by those in the ancient world who first received it. The sons of God were angels. Several references throughout the Bible point this out. Job 1.6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. This verse could be interpreted by some to show that the sons of God were kings or leaders, except when you get to Job chapter 38, verse 4-7. through 7. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures, therefore, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations, therefore, fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God are shouting for joy at the earth being created, when Jesus sat down the cornerstones of the earth. There is no way they could be man. Man was not created at this time. In the New Testament, Second Peter 2 4 and Jude 1 6 reference angels sinning and not keeping their proper abode. They were put in chains and await judgment. The book of Enoch states this was what happened to the two hundred angels who took wives of the daughters of men in the time before the flood. Peter and Jude are probably referencing the book of Enoch. The most logical place in the Bible where angels were sinning and leaving their proper place is Genesis 6. The offspring of the sons of God and daughters of men were the Nephilim. Nephilim translates as giants. It also translates as the fallen ones, due to the Jewish root word nephal, which means to fall. Sometimes the word is used as a catchphrase for all the fallen angels and their giant offspring. This lumping together of the groups can lead to some confusion. A fallen angel is very different from a half-human giant. The flood of Noah killed everything that had breath that was not in the ark. This would have included the Nephilim giants, but not the fallen angels who fathered them. 
they would have to be bound and cast into the depths of the earth to be buried. The book of Enoch says this is what happened to them, and they were to remain bound for seventy generations until judgment. The Bible itself describes angels having to be bound and cast under the earth, most notably Satan in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Noah's flood removed the genetic influence of the fallen angels on the earth at that time, but not permanently. The Nephilim would return again. This time we have no direct reference as to how they came back. One could speculate that another group of fallen angels may have again cohabitated with women, since the original 200 who came to Mount Hermon was not the only fallen angels. In Satan's rebellion against God, he took one-third of the angels to his side. They would have numbered in the thousands. Other speculative thoughts on where the post-flood giants came from include the idea that a few may have survived the flood by some means of escape. They may have left on UFOs or found a way to enter other dimensions, thus enabling them to return. Another thought is that one of the wives of Noah's sons had Nephilim DNA in her family line and it reappeared generations later. All we know for certain from the Bible is that they again inhabit the earth after the flood. Genesis 14 verses 1 through 5 tells us of their presence in the time of Abraham, somewhere around 1900 BC. The story starts with the five cities of the plain in the area of what is now the Dead Sea. They would come under the rule of the king of Elam and his allies for 12 years. They would revolt in the thirteenth year. On the fourteenth year, the king of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebulon, and Zor would have to face King Chedolamer of Elam. Elam was in southwestern Iran, and Marifel, king of Shinar. Shinar is thought to be in, Ir thought to be in Iraq, the area of Sumner. Ariok, king of Eleazar. Eleazar was a city in the east bank of the Euphrates, in title, king of nations. Title is thought to have ruled a loose confederation of cities, possibly in the Hittite region of Turkey. The king of Elam's forces didn't come directly to the cities of the plain. The king of Elam's forces didn't come directly to the cities of the plain. <clears throat> First they struck areas inhabited by groups that are known from scripture to be races of giants. They attacked the Raphi Raphaims in Astaroth, Garnium, the Zumzims in Ham, and the Amims in Shava Kirathium. Astaroth Karnium was in the Bashan area, 28 miles south of Damascus, Syria. Ham was a city east of the Jordan River. Shava Kirathium, a city on the plains of Kirathium in Moab, which is now in Jordan. Why they attacked these cities first, or at all, is not mentioned in the Bible. 